What's up and welcome to the video. My name is Dr. Daniel Ricciardi, gut health expert, licensed pharmacist, and fitness enthusiast. I help clients resolve bloating, gas, and digestive problems so they can look and feel their best. When I sat down to make this video, I intended for it to be about discussing some of the root causes of SIBO. However, when diving into this topic, I realized that people don't just get SIBO right after the root cause of their SIBO occurs. In most cases, bacteria are not just immediately injected into the small intestine after the root cause happens. There is another step in between. I narrowed it down to four specific problems that can occur in this extra step. One of these problems always develops after the root cause happens and before SIBO occurs, so it's right in the middle. The four problems that occur right before SIBO happens are one, impaired gut motility, two is impaired immune function, number three is a leaky ileothecal valve, and number four is intestinal adhesions. As I mentioned before, the process goes root cause, one of these four problems, and then SIBO. The first is impaired gut motility. And when I say impaired gut motility, I mean the motility of the small intestine is slower than it should be. If you've done some of your own research on SIBO before, you've probably come across this concept. However, it's very unlikely that you'll have slow gut motility for no reason. You probably have had one or more root causes that have led to this impaired gut motility, such as food poisoning. Although food poisoning does not guarantee that you will definitely get SIBO, it is a very common root cause of SIBO. And even with food poisoning, you don't typically get SIBO right away. The bacteria that cause food poisoning, including E. coli, Campylobacter jejuni, Shigella, Salmonella, they release a toxin known as cytolethal distending toxin, or CDTB. Unfortunately, this toxin looks a lot like a normal protein in your intestine called vinculin. This vinculin helps with a lot of cellular functions in the intestines, including gut motility. As a result, because this vinculin looks like this toxin, your body can end up making this antibody called anti-vinculin. Not a very creative name, but this antibody ends up attacking these vinculin proteins and making them not able to do their job as well. As a result, gut motility is impaired. It's essentially an autoimmune condition that can result from food poisoning. This is a long explanation, but as you can see, getting food poisoning does not directly lead to SIBO. There's another step that happens in between. So in this example, food poisoning is the root cause. Impaired gut motility happens next and then finally SIBO would occur. Another example of a root cause causing slow gut motility is grazing, which is eating small amounts of food constantly throughout the day. This is something that I constantly did in my 20s, which is the basically decade that I had SIBO. Think of the person that keeps a bag of snacks at their desk and is constantly munching on something. I'm not saying that grazing will always cause SIBO and that it's going to be bad for everybody that does it, but doing so can prevent your migrating motor complex or MMC, which which is a system of muscles and nerves from completely sweeping clean your small intestine from food after you eat. It's basically the cleanup crew of your intestine. SIBO researcher Dr. Mark Pimentel explains grazing kind of like eating off of a plate but never rinsing the plate clean before you're going to use it the next time. The key thing to remember is that the migrating motor complex only works when you're not eating. After you eat, it begins working and the next time that you put food into your body, it will stop working. There's some various research on how how long it takes the migrating motor complex to completely sweep the intestine clean, but I prefer to go at least four hours in between meals and not have snacks in between. The second problem that can occur that can lead to SIBO is weak digestive secretions or impaired immune function. This concept may not be as well understood, but stomach acid, digestive enzymes, and bile all play a role in your immune system. Stomach acid helps kill some of the bacteria in your stomach that are ingested from food and drinks. Digestive enzymes can affect the pH level in the intestine, which can indirectly control how many bacteria can live in there, and bile serves a number of functions, and one of them being able to kill some of the bacteria that are in your small intestine. As you can see, these digestive secretions can play a major role in how many bacteria you have in your small intestine. Certain medications, such as proton pump inhibitors or PPIs, can lower stomach acid. Having a bile duct obstruction can limit the amount of bile that can flow from your gallbladder into your small intestine, and having diabetes can reduce the number of digestive enzymes that your pancreas can produce. In these examples, the root causes would be taking PPI, having a gallbladder duct obstruction, and diabetes. All three of these root causes lead to this next problem, which is weakened digestive secretions and impaired immune function. After this happens, then you're more likely to get SIBO. As an important note, having chronic stress can actually lower the amount of all three of these digestive secretions. The reason is being stressed out puts you in this fight or flight mode and your body is not prioritizing digesting food 
it during this time, which is actually a good thing because if your life's actually in danger, being able to digest food in that moment is not very important. The third problem that can lead to SIBO is a leaky ileothecal valve. This is not to be confused with leaky gut, which is when the cells that line your small intestine become spaced apart, which causes a lot of inflammation and a lot of other problems. The ileothecal valve is a valve that separates the small intestine from the large intestine. It's meant to be a one-way valve only, allowing substances only to travel from the small intestine down into the large intestine. It's located halfway between your belly button and right hip bone. You can't really see what I'm doing right now, but if you notice there's some tenderness when you press firmly with a few fingers on that area and rotate them around, or hear a constant gurgling sound when you do this, it's possible that the ileothecal valve is in an open position, which is not really what we want. It's not really well understood why the ileothecal valve can be stuck open, but some proposed reasons are chronic stress, spicy food, and eating too much fiber. This 2012 study by the World Journal of Gastroenterology looked at if SIBO was more common in patients with ileothecal valve dysfunction. It concluded that compared to normal, subjects with a positive lactulose breath test have a defective ileothecal valve cecal distension reflex. These subjects also more commonly have higher symptom scores. Basically what this means is that they took these patients and they pumped air into their large intestine near the ileothecal valve. And then they measured the air pressure in the large intestine near the ileothecal valve. Higher air pressure in that area meant that the ileothecal valve was working and was closed. A lower air pressure meant that the ileothecal valve was not working and was open. It's kind of like an inflated balloon. If you blow up a balloon and then pinch it shut, there's going to be a lot of air pressure in the balloon. But if you open your fingers a little bit and the air escapes out of the balloon, you'll notice that the balloon feels way softer. So in doing this study, they found that patients with an open ileothecal valve were much more likely to have SIBO. And the fourth and final problem is intestinal adhesions. Adhesions are tough bands of scar tissue that can form after abdominal surgeries. They can prevent normal gut motility in your intestine because parts of the intestine can become stuck together. You can think of it kind of like parts of your intestine are super glued together, so they're not able to squeeze properly to propel the food throughout the small intestine. This tip typically only happens after surgeries. So in this case, an abdominal surgery would be the root cause and adhesion would be the problem that happens after it. And this can lead to SIBO. As a quick recap, the four problems that can lead to SIBO are number one, impaired gut motility or impaired small intestinal motility. Two, weakened digestive secretions or impaired immune function. Three is a leaky ileothecal valve and four is intestinal adhesions. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I post a new full length video every Monday in YouTube shorts throughout the week. Since you watched till the end, I think you'll enjoy one of these two videos next. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.